Okay, well, <clears throat> welcome back. We're, uh, we're on deck. This is prep test 85, <clears throat> section 3, logical reasoning. We're going to start with question number 11. The issue, the flaw in the lobbyist reasoning can most effectively be demonstrated by noting that by parallel reasoning, we could conclude. Okay. Uh, so let's see what we could conclude here. Uh, so, so let's say, identify the flaw. So I'm looking here and it says lobbyists says those who claim that auto automobile exhaust emissions are a risk to public health are mistaken. So stop for a second. So there are two variables, right? There's uh, the the emissions, okay, and there's public health. And uh, the lobbyist is saying that. The claim that one impacts the other uh, adversely is wrong. Okay, let's find out why. During the last century, as automobile exhaust emissions increased, every relevant indicator of public health improved dramatically rather than deteriorated. Okay, so I, I get it, and the flaw is pretty apparent. Uh, uh, so if I just like sum this up. Uh, uh, automobile, either the person concludes that uh, that the automobile exhaust is not a risk to public health because though automobile exhaust itself has increased, uh, public health has gotten better. Okay, so let's see what we have. But that, I mean, basically, that's it. Two factors. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one is ne negative. They could go anywhere on this in terms of. Uh, you could view the emissions as a variable, it's like a set within the, I'm sorry, a subset within the set of things that impact um, public health. And, you know, if they went that way, the flaw would be simply because the set has a characteristic, which is that it's, um, it's something that's unhealthy. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that like the subset, you know, a variable is unhealthy. It doesn't mean the, uh, the large unit itself shares that attribute. So let's see where they go. Uh, a, inspecting commercial airplanes for safety is unnecessary because the number of commercial airline uh, airplane crashes has decreased over the last decade. Um, well, I, you know, I wouldn't throw it out. It's, it's not compelling to me. Uh, I, you know, if that had said inspecting commercial airlines with cracked windows, like there had been something else there, uh, for safety is unnecessary because there are fewer airline crashes, maybe, but, you know, so let's keep reading. I would certainly keep reading. B, smoking cigarettes is not bad for one's health because not all cigarette smokers get smoking-related illnesses. And I'm not seeing that as analogous at all. Um, C. Using a cell phone while driving is not dangerous because the number of traffic accidents has decreased since the invention of the cell phone. <laughs> yeah, that would be the answer. Because you just analogize the cell phone to the automobile exhaust, right? I'm meaning the use of the, not cell phone itself, but, but the use of the cell phone uh, while driving does represent a risk. You're saying, but we need not pay attention to that because the number of traffic accidents themselves have gone down. So C is certainly going to be the answer. Uh, D, skydiving is not dangerous because the number of injuries to skydivers has decreased in recent years. No. There's no, you know, you have to have something else in there between skydivers and the danger of skydiving. Uh, and E, people with insurance do not need to lock their doors. Because if anything is stolen, the insurance company will pay to replace it. I have no clue um, how you would pick E unless there was just no F. So the answer number 11 is, is C for Caligula. Question number 12. The conclusion drawn in the argument. So the issue here is the conclusion drawn in the argument follows logically which one of the following is assumed. So it's a sufficient assumption. Let's see what I have here. <clears throat> 
a recently discovered fossil, which is believed by some to have come from whatever that is, a species of dinosaur, can serve as evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs only if the entire fossil is from a single animal. Okay. So, you know, only if is always something you pay attention to. And I have the first sentence, and I analyze that first sentence, and I get it. So we have a fossil, and some believe it to be evidence that it's a uh, species of dinosaur okay. uh, <clears throat> that can serve as evidence that the birds evolved from the dinosaurs, but that can be the case only if that fossil is a single animal. Next sentence. However, the fossil is a composite of bones. So you should automatically see the connection between composite of bones and single animal. However, the fossil is a composite of bones collected from various parts of the discovery site. So it does not provide evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. So the sufficient assumption there is that if it's a fossil, it's not a composite of bones. Or something like that. So you're just putting those two terms together. Uh, a, uh, the only paleontologists who believe that the entire fossil is from a single animal are those who were already convinced that the birds evolved from dinosaurs. Okay, maybe that's true, but who cares? <clears throat> B, if the fossil is a composite, then it has pieces of more than one animal. Yeah, 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 it, meaning it can't be the single animal. It's a composite. So, uh, I, I don't know how you don't pick B. I don't know how you don't then stop reading. And it can only be one sufficient assumption. But yeah, I mean, B is saying, right, if that fossil is a composite, then it has pieces of more than one animal. And if it has pieces of more than one animal, well then, hello, you know, it's not evidence. Because it can be evidence only if the fossil is from one animal. Nevertheless, C. There are other fossils that provide evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Okay, wonderful, but that's not this argument. D, if an entire fossil is from a single animal, then it is a well-preserved specimen. I don't have a clue. I, I mean, I just don't get how anyone who's going to use IRAC would end up on D. And E, the fossil was stolen from the discovery site and sold by someone who cared much more about personal profit then about the accuracy of the fossil record. Shoot me. That, that, you know, just don't do that again if you pick the. So the answer in 12 is B for Brutus. 13. Which one of the following most accurately describes a flaw and a reason? Okay. Here we go. A new screening test has been developed for syndrome Q. Research has shown that the test yields a positive for syndrome Q whenever the person tested has that syndrome. So let's just stop for a second here. The word whenever is a word that is synonymous with the word if. I mean, think of the two words together, whenever and if. You know, uh, whenever it rains, I get wet. If I rain, I get wet. Uh, so this, this, just from the second sentence, this is fitting into the flaw within the if-then world, right? And, and that then takes me to my, you know, my, my book of flaws, right? That in that if-then world, you say, the if here is, you know, if the person tested has the syndrome, right, uh, then the, uh, the, uh, the test will yield positive. So it's the if you have the syndrome, then you will, <clears throat> the test will be positive. But the conclusion is, so, since he shows positive, must have the syndrome. No, no. So however you want to look at it, this is an if-then statement where the, what the evidence we're given is that if you have the syndrome, right, you're going in and you have syndrome Q, uh, then this test is going to reveal that. Okay. But the conclusion is, since the test revealed it, then you have syndrome Q. That doesn't follow. Um, uh, um, uh, it, 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 it's the if then again going back to if it rains I'll get wet right 
I got wet, therefore it rained. And that's flawed because, again, take that first statement, if it rains, I'll get wet. Well, that's one way to get wet. That is, it's, in other words, it's a sufficient condition that if it rains, I'll get wet. And you break down here, it's a sufficient condition, right? That if I have the syndrome, it's going gonna, it's gonna to test positive. That's sufficient. But it's not necessary. You know, there are other ways I can get wet. Uh, there are other, so here you say, so Justin tested positive, right? Meaning, I got wet. Uh, and therefore she must have the syndrome. No, that doesn't follow. Uh, so what they're doing here is conflating necessary and sufficient conditions. And let's see what we come here. Um, uh, so A says, it confuses a claim that a subject will test positive when the syndrome is present. Right, right, I had it, right, then I took the test and it tested positive, but I, I had it, yeah, that's correct. It confuses that claim with the claim that any subject who tests positive has the syndrome. That is correct. The mere fact that <clears throat> I test positive does not mean necessarily that I have the syndrome. It means, it's not gonna mean, well, it may mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. So the answer to uh, 13 is A. You really want to think about it. It's a really important, it's, I think it's a really difficult way they presented it. It would be a hell of a lot easier if they said, you know, research shows that every time it rains you get wet. So, Justin, uh, <clears throat> just, Justin was wet and therefore Justin must have been out in the rain. That'd be a hell of a lot easier. But follow the analogy of that simple example with this more uh, complex example and you'll come out to the same, same position, which is, you know, it's every if then, and whenever is the same as an if then, every if then says it's sufficient, right? The if is sufficient to bring about the then. It does not follow from that merely because the then came about. It's from the result of the if. It can be from any number of other results. So the answer there is A. B says it makes a general claim regarding the accuracy of the test the syndrome Q without providing scientific justification for the claim. And again, if you had the answer in your mind, you wouldn't be reading this. Uh, C, it fails to adequately distinguish between a person's not having syndrome Q and that person's not testing positive. But th this is not about the negative, it's about the positive. Uh, D, it confuses a claim about the accuracy of a test for uh, syndrome Q in an arbitrary group of individuals with a similar claim about accuracy of tests for a single individual. It's nowhere close. Uh, uh, e, it confuses the test having no reliable results uh, for the presence of syndrome Q with it having no reliable results for the absence. Again, it's not about the absence of it, it's about the presence of it. And I would urge you on question 13, insofar that there's any ambiguity, um, if you haven't seen the video on the Book of Laws or the videos on if-then statements, send me an email and let's get you the video. So the answer to question number 13 is A for Augustus. Question number 14, which one of the following is most strongly supported by the musician's claim? Okay, and here's the, uh, music, histori the music historian. Uh, in, you know, in the past, radio stations would not play rock songs that were more than three minutes in length. Yes, I'm old enough to remember that. Rock musicians claim that such commercial barriers limited their creativity. Commercial barriers limited my creativity. And some critics argue uh, that only since those barriers have been lifted has rock music become artistic. That's what some critics argue, okay. In fact, however, when those barriers were lifted, the standard for song structures broke down and the music became aimless because the styles from which rock derived were not well suited to strongs of ex uh, songs of extended length. So you stop. Now here, as opposed to question 13, where you're talking about syndrome Q, here the language is much more straightforward. You know, it's much more the conversation you have every day. So this is an argument that's really meant to be understood. And you say, so what is most strongly supported from that? Well, if I go back, right, and first you, you tell me three minutes was the limit in the day. Okay. Then you go on to say, 
that the musicians claim that those commercial barriers, which limited three minutes, those barriers limited your creativity. Okay, got it. Further, some critics argue that it's only been since those barriers uh, that have been lifted that the music has become more artistic. We got it. Next three words are really important. In fact, however, so it's going to dispute what just preceded it. In fact, however, when the barriers were lifted, the standards for song structures broke down. And the music became aimless. Because the styles from which rock derived are not well suited to these songs of extended length. So what, what follows from this is that those barriers, right, that, that were uh, prevented music from going longer than three minutes served a useful purpose and in the absence of those barriers there's been a negative consequence. So again, I don't have the exact words, but that's what's most strongly supported. Okay, hey, rock music is not a good outlet for creative musicians who have a great many ideas. That's certainly not what my mind produced. B, uh, rock music must borrow from styles more conducive to songs of extended length if it is to become artistic. I don't disagree with that, but it's not what most closely follows from this. At least I don't think it does. Uh, C. Rock music requires more discipline than some other forms of music. I have no clue what that means. Uh, D. Rock music can sometimes benefit from the existence of commercial barriers rather than being harmed by them. And that's so clearly the answer. And this is so clearly the answer. If you've done Iraq, if you've done the analysis. A lot of these little things come down from the trees today. Pollen, I guess. I don't put it this way. Alright. E. Rock music is best when it is made by musicians who not think of them, do not think of themselves as being self conscious artists. Again, I have no clue why I pick E. So the answer to question number 14 is D for Drusus. We'll close this out in question number 15. Uh, the argument is which of the following? So it's kind of like asking me, the argument is which of the following? I don't know. Maybe how the argument proceeds technique, something like that. So, let's see what we have here. Uh, so, we have, first we have a statement that some food historians conclude that recipes compiled by an ancient Roman named Epicus are a reliable indicator, indicator of how wealthy Romans prepared spiced their food. So, stop for a second. Okay. So, so we have some, some apicius, whatever it is, right? And, and it left us some recipes, and there are some food historians who believe those recipes are evidence of how wealthy Romans uh, in ancient times prepared and spiced their foods. Okay, I got it, next. Since few other recipes from ancient Rome have survived, this conclusion is far too hasty. Okay, no, I, if there are few, it does seem to me it's far too... Now, I, I direct your attention to the conclusion is that the what's far too hasty, right, is the view that that is how wealthy Romans prepared and spiced their food. When you say it's far too hasty, you don't say it's wrong. You say, go back and give me more evidence, but you're not saying it's wrong. If you want to say it was wrong, you'd say the conclusion is false. So just, this is what they're testing on. The difference between reading that as a lawyer and reading that as a regular person, they didn't say it was false. They said it was far too hasty. Go back to your drawing board, get more evidence. Okay. And here's the evidence in support of the conclusion that it's far too hasty. After all, the recipe of, of Apicus uh, may have been highly atypical, just like the recipes of many notable modern chefs. Okay, yeah, yeah. Ma you know, maybe this guy was a vegetarian. Maybe he, uh, not, not, you know, maybe he, he had some. He was just not typical of what most people in Roman ate. And we look at his recipe, saying, "Well, this is this must must be what they ate." And we don't know that. So I got that. So I'm fine. Okay. Uh, so the argument is which of the following? Um, and you know, to me, it's. I'm not, I, I'm going to have to look here. I mean, what the argument does, if I'm trying to get something in my mind before I look at these answer choices, um, it, it, it says that you got to go back and get more evidence, right? That, that the evidence we have is 
is not substantiated enough, uh, and we need to get more. Okay, we'll see. A. It rejects a view held by some food historians solely on the ground that there is insufficient evidence to support it, and A is what makes the LSAT a great test. That's so not the answer. And it so has to do with the one word, rejects. The conclusion does not reject. It is that it's far too hasty. So, you know, I, I could see, I, I, I venture to, I, I mean, I imagine tons of people picked A because they, they didn't get the connection between a conclusion that says something is far too hasty and an answer choice that represents that conclusion as though it rejects, it doesn't reject, it sends it back for further consideration. Uh, B, it offers support for review held by some food historians by providing a modern uh, analog to that view. No, it's not supporting that view. Uh, C, it, it takes issue with the view of some food historians, yes, it does take issue with other support, by providing a modern analog that purportedly undercuts their view, and that is incorrect. Now again, that word analog, you probably haven't used the word analog a whole lot this week or last week, um, but you know, it's analogy, it's, a, it's analog, it's analogy, uh, and C is right, if you break C down, it takes issue with the view of some food historians, those were the ancient ones, right? Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't mean the ancient ones, but those are the food historians who concluded that these things were what, how the Roman elite prepared and spiced their food. Uh, so it, it takes issue with that, the argument does, by providing a modern analog, which is folks to modern chefs, right, that undercuts their view, that you have modern chefs who are atypical, and they're using that evidence to suggest that perhaps what we're looking at was a recipes of an atypical chef back when. So the answer is going to be C for sure. Uh, D says it uses a conclusion drawn by some food historians as the basis for a conclusion about a modern analog. No, they conflict. And E, it tries to bolster a conclusion about the similarity of historical times to modern times by comparing a conclusion drawn by some food historians to a modern an analog, and of course doesn't try to bolster that conclusion of similarity. And so the answer to 15 is C for Caligula.